you're picking an Angus bull, you want an Angus bull that's probably 15 to 19 kilos of carcass. And that's the figure you always look at as the carcass figure to make sure that they're going to have plenty of power to grow. Or if a Belgian blue, you know, or whatever, one of those type breeds that have shorter gestation maybe. You know, hopefully you're going to look for something maybe that's well in the 20s or maybe the 30s for carcass. At least then you have a calf that has, okay, it's late in the season, but it does have good genetics and it does make it a bit more saleable when you're trying to move those late calves, uh, you know, that are going to be born at the latter end. Within all those bulls and within those breeds, you get very easy calving traits and you can get relatively short gestation. Hello, I'm Stuart Childs and you're welcome to the Dairy Age, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. With the dairy breeding season approximately two-thirds complete, beef bulls or beef AI are the order of the day at this stage. This week, ahead of Beef 24 in Grange, County Mead, I'm joined by Alan Dillon, Dairy Beef 500 Programme Coordinator, to discuss beef genetics for the last few weeks of the breeding season. And I started by asking Alan where late-born beef calves fit into dairy beef systems. big thing to remember is, right, uh, generally the, the, the more in tune, we'll say, calf to beef buyer likes to buy his calves probably close enough in age. Um, he wants to buy them in a short period and get them a bit like the Mendes calf and the cows. He wants to start rearing them quick and he wants to finish quick. So ideally, he wants his calves probably landing in the air the vast majority, you know, within three to four weeks. Now, the time he starts buying can vary. Okay, they can, it can be anything from buying them in late January up to maybe late February. It depends on when he wants to be killing and it depends on shed capacity and depends on a number of factors. Um, but I suppose what they do want is a, is a reasonably compact group of calves. If you take the average number that's been bought, I suppose, across farms, it's, it's generally less than 40 is the average. You know, it, having them fairly uniform in age is quite important. You don't want much more than, a, I suppose, a month or five weeks between the oldest and the youngest because generally a lot of these calves are run as one group around the place. So, you know, having these calves that are born maybe well into April or into May or even June, you know, they're, those are the calves that are going to suffer and they're never really going to come into anything because they're not going to be able to compete with the older calves uh, in the same paddock. And look, being honest, running a couple of, of these later calves on their own or on the farm is basically a, a painful operation, trying to fence them into little plots and throw and meal them for the whole summer, etc. You know, what guys want is they want a uniform group that'll that'll travel around together you can feed a meal at the same time, you can stop at the same time, you can dose at the same time. It's just creating a bit of simplicity in the system. So effectively what you're saying is that um, the ideal scenario ties in very well with the dairy breeding scenario um, and that the dairy farmers should continue to focus on having that very defined breeding season um, to make sure that they're tying in with the that buying period. And as I said, there, there is variation with variation. I'm, when I say we're two to three weeks, or sorry, two thirds of the way through the dairy breeding season, that's varying from north to south as you go. There's some people just hitting the six weeks, maybe some people not, not even hit six weeks, maybe. And then there are some people that are actually beginning to get to the point of finishing up. So there is a, a good window there and it probably matches in terms of the, the, the calf sales trade will probably follow a similar line, I suppose, in terms of the dairy breeding trade as well. But I suppose, Alan, the, what should the focus be for dairy farmers though if we if we take that average point and say that they're two thirds of the way through so they've about maybe eight weeks or so done or coming close to it for the following a couple of weeks now we have two situations as I said there a few minutes ago we have maybe still a, a proportion of AI going on but there's also those uh, beef bulls are going to be released in, in the next couple of weeks if they're not already gone at this point so what should the dairy farmer be focusing on in terms of the the AI straws that they're choosing and the, the bull that they have on hand now, like, okay, maybe it's too late to do something about him now at this stage if he's not the right type of bull, but just to be aware for a future, uh, the type of bull that they should be looking for. And I suppose the, the big question is continental versus the traditional uh, breeds, we say like your Herefords or your Anguses. Is there a preference out there in, in the trade in terms of the type of calf that's going to be bought that way? Yeah, I suppose just to go back to the first point, I suppose if if you take it right, that right, you're eight weeks through or whatever in the breeding season. You know, your your job is now is to compact it as much at the at the at the the latter end as you can to try and tighten the whole thing up. Um, look, you know, probably using these maybe longer gestation continentals or some of the Charlie cementals limousines is going to make that situation a bit worse. So you're probably going to look at you know your shorter gestation bulls, your you know your Anguses, uh, maybe your Belgian blues, etc. Would probably fit that. And you know you can pick some of those bulls that are quite short gestation, but they still do have actually excellent carcass traits. 
Um, and I suppose if you do want to create a bit of a saleable calf that's going to come maybe in the latter end of the season, what you want is you want to you know have that calf that has the best genetics going. You know, so you know if you're if you're picking an Angus bull, you want an Angus bull that's probably fifteen to nineteen kilos of carcass, and that's the figure you always look at as the carcass figure to make sure that they're going to have plenty of power to grow. Um, or if a Belgian blue, you know, or whatever, one of those type breeds that have shorter gestation, maybe, you know, you're hopefully going to look for something maybe that's well in the 20s or maybe the 30s for carcass. And at least then you have a calf that has, okay, it's late in the season, but it does have good genetics and it does make it a bit more saleable when you're trying to move those late calves, uh, you know, that are going to be born at the latter end. Because we see there, you know, we've seen the trade the last number of years. Um, once you hit into that, um, I suppose, that, that March into April period, the, ta- the calf trade has tended to collapse for a number of weeks um, when the glut comes. And, you know, really what you're trying to do is differentiate yourself as a farmer that's selling calves from everyone else that, you know, you have the best genetics going and, you know, your calves are healthy and they will grow and they will give little trouble or no trouble, hopefully, and um, that they're, you're going to have a repeat customer coming back again. If you're talking, I suppose, about the stock bulls, uh, I suppose you have what you have at this stage. I mean, there's, it's highly unlikely you're going to go... Um, buying a, a stock bull now that's going to be turning there for the next couple of weeks but essentially what you want is you know if you're buying a bull again you're buying genetics you want to buy the best genetics going and, and these bulls aren't cheap i mean you know people coming along saying they're a budget of 1500 euros for a, a stock bull or whatever uh, you know i'd really question the quality of the genetics you're buying for that i mean good stock bulls are not cheap and that's been the message always you have to pay for good genetics and that's why i suppose ai is a much better option probably in terms of getting good genetics into the herd that you know it's it's not exactly anything much much dearer for a good quality straw versus a versus a poor quality genetic genetic bull in the straw so it's it's probably that bit bit more competitive um but i suppose look in terms of when you're looking what are you looking for in a bull you still want the gestation length to be as short as possible and look within certain breeds that is the situation uh but you, you do want that that carcass figure has to be high and we do see within the stock bulls that are being purchased still, there's a huge number of these bulls are coming in with very poor carcass characteristics. Um, and, and look, there's some excellent ones out there too, but it's down to farmers to actually know what they're looking at when they're buying bulls. So when you're going changing your bull there maybe next year or this end of this year, whenever you're buying them, you know, look at that carcass figure. You know, if he's an early maturing breed, you, you don't want to be dipping below plus 10 kilos of carcass for um for any dip, for any any early maturings if you're into continentals look you'll be nothing less than 20 you know you should be pushing well into the 30s even in terms of carcass characteristics and you still get within all those bulls and within those breeds you get very easy calving traits and you can get relatively short gestation look the gestation lengths vary obviously with the breed some some continentals go quite far but that'll be uh, kind of uh, in the genetic makeup of the bull and you'll be able to see that in the in the Eurostar figures yeah, and I suppose uh, you mentioned the, the Belgian blue versus the Angus in that scenario. The Ireland and Belgian blues generally have a good reputation around the gestation length. Uh, obviously, the Anguses are w- well known for that. Is there? There's two questions, I suppose. Is there an advantage, a greater advantage, to the fact that the Angus is an early maturing breed if it's arriving late, that it kind of still will be out the gap at the same time for the farmer that's buying them? Yeah, it possibly will. I suppose in terms of a. I suppose it was coming in terms of a heifer, let's say take an Angus heifer just for the, uh, pick, to pick an example, you know, right, if they're born, let's say in April, you know, you, you still hope to have them gone in 20 months. So they should still kind of maybe be gone with a short finishing period in the shed, maybe in the in the uh, back end of the year. You know, you're probably talking around the November, December kill with them. Um, you know, if you're going maybe with a, a bullock, it's going to take that bit longer anyway. Um, so you're guaranteed a shed kill really with them regardless you know an April born bullock it's it's unlikely you'll push them all through before the, the second winter in most scenarios you know that's why these early calf is often favoured especially with the early maturing breeds you're able to get the most grass in the diet and maybe finish them at a slightly lighter carcass you know in the back end of the year or a, a proportion of them not all of them so it, it eliminates a, an expensive feeding period at the back end in, 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 in most scenarios with regards to continentals look Belgium blues and that by and large are talking a bit of a later finish with them anyway just by the, the nature of them that's what they are they will kill out better they will perform you know they will have a good carcass weight in fairness um, but you're probably looking at a, a significant feeding period in the shed anyway with them that's the regardless so they will probably be pushed well into the following spring with the likes of those ones so look 
it's it's um it's probably the Angus and the early maturing is maybe a bit more preferable in terms of if someone wants to get these cattle turned over quite fast. Um, Herefords probably would fit the bill too. Uh, once you can get the the carcass figure up as high as possible. Yeah, getting the right Hereford has been a challenge, but has been become a little bit easier in the last couple of uh, in the last year or two probably. Has a bit, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, look when I'm looking for bulls and I wanted to see what dairy farmers are using. Again, I have this minimum figure of you know ten kilos of carcass to try and get a bit of weight in them because you know you want to hit that three hundred to three twenty kilo of carcass without too much hassle, without too much feeding, and you do need to push that carcass value as high as possible when you're picking these bulls, and that's important. It has been tricky in the Hereford breed just to try, and if we look at the the the, the dairy beef index um, and some of the the you know the catalogs there for the last while to try and find bulls and that, but we have started to see a few more there now in the last year or two, and they have started to prop up. But again, it's it's down to farmers individually to go out there themselves and pick these bulls and know what they're looking for. You know, there is a... I have seen it talking to a number of farmers over the last 12 months. There's a, there's a big lack of awareness about what you're looking for when you're picking a beef bull for your dairy cows. Um, you know, it's 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 more than just the calving ease, gestation length, the carcass figure, and I suppose, you know, the I suppose the um, carbon sub-index, et cetera, comes into a lesser extent. But, you know, you do want to get power on these cattle. You want to have ones that will grow, that will thrive, that will deliver a carcass spec that's suitable for processors and will not eat your house and home, I suppose, either in terms of meal. Yeah, okay. So the other question that I that was come, came to my mind as we were talking there a few minutes ago is um, in relation to the carcass weight. How important is confirmation, Alan? Um, is, or is it just purely exactly as it says on the tin kind of that it's, it's how they look and it maybe gives, it might be a selling point, but how important is it to you from a profitability point of view? Wouldn't be the greatest thing I'd be worried about. I mean, if you take it, when they're coming out of a dairy cow, you know, they're going to, depending on what the beef sire is, they're going to come somewhere between an O and an R. Um, unlikely you'll get too many outside of that, uh, higher than that, we'll say, in terms of going pushing to high R grades and U grades. Okay, if you use continentals, you might get some. And it depends what cow type you have as well, you know. That can have a bearing also. Um, you know, if you're a more square type, british type cow, if there's some of them left, that, you know, you will probably find it easier to get a higher grade animal. But we accept that. When you're buying these calves, you're going to be dealing predominantly O grades or maybe low R grade in cattle. That's what you're going to have. And look, the difference between the the the, the grade bonuses, you know, is not dramatic. It's six cents still. You know, it's it's much more important, I think, that we get carcasses up high. You know, we need to be hitting the carcasses well into the three hundreds, and that's where we want to be with these cattle. Uh, and that's what processors want as well. They don't want carcasses down at you know, an animal that's going to grade, you know, a U minus or an R plus, which is, you know, 240, 250 kilos um, live weight, you know, or dead weight, sorry. Um, you know, they want to open the live weight. So I would say, look, you, you kind of, you, you you know what you're going to get when you're buying something off a dairy cow. It's going to be mostly O grades. That's what you're going to get. And you accept that and you build that into your buying price. And look, there's, with the early maturings, there is some, um, I suppose breed bonuses and they can be substantial at certain times of the year that can uh, prop up the price in terms of uh, a lot more than maybe a, an extra grade or two in the factory can Okay and you mentioned buying price there now Alan as well um, I suppose two questions in relation to that look there's no two ways about it dairy farmers will all like to, we know, if we even all hit the 90% calved in six weeks, there's still six weeks more calving to take place that there's going to be calves born over that period of time. Obviously not a huge number, but nationally, we're sitting at around the, just below the 70, uh, 70% 70 calve six weeks type uh, situation. So there's a good proportion of calves coming in that latter six weeks period. Uh, to, is there a perception out there that all those calves will have to be sold through a mart or whatever, or are there farmers that you're dealing with that are happy to buy those calves as part of an overall package of buying calves from a, uh, from a farm, from a dairy farm? Yeah, look, I suppose we said at the start, the preference is for the early calves and filling the place quickly. Um, so, you know, farmers want to, the, the typical farmer is going to want to, you know, buy most of these calves fairly fast and they'll probably be the first six weeks of calves that are born, you know. Uh, but now, saying that, we, we do like, the farmers do like to go in and, and buy, I suppose, uh you know, a, a, a package deal as well if, if it's available. So, you know, if they go into a farmer and he's got 80 cows or 100 cows, we we'll say just for a round figure, and he might have 70 calves to sell, you know, we've seen plenty of farmers come in and say, look, you know, I take the first 50 or 60 calves off you, you know, at, at uh, whatever price. And we'll, 
you just give me a text every week and tell me or when, every two weeks and tell me when you have a group ready and I'll come along with the trailer on a Saturday and pick them up and they're gone and that's simple and they come back next year and they do the same thing because if the calves go well and the price isn't extortionate you know they'll be they'll be happy enough to just keep going and it'll work both, be, both ways too I mean we've seen there you know at the start of the year that the, the price of calves is very high you know you see these early maturing ones making 250 and 300 euros a lot of the time at the start uh, and then you see they suddenly collapse to maybe 30 or 40 euros kind of come mid-March or late March. And look, there's no farmer going to go in offering, beef farmer going to go in offering dairy farmers, you know, 30 or 40 euros for all these calves on the basis that's the price in March. Generally, what I'd say, if you were to give advice is set a mid-range price. You know, if you if the early ones are going to make 200 and the late ones are going to make 70, you know, settle on something in the middle, maybe 140 for calves and do a deal across the board. I mean that does no no one wants to be if you know if a, if a, deal, a farmer comes in to do a deal he's going to do a deal for a bunch that's going to come over six weeks and he's not going to really argue if the price drops in the market he's a deal done set price that's it you know so set a mid range price don't have your expectations too high uh, when you when you're doing a deal there maybe in January or February for calves um, you know sell your wares I suppose as well too show them the benefits of what you've used if you've made a big effort and used high DBI bulls a good carcass you know show them what you have and show them what you got and, and, and the effort you've put in and that they should turn into good quality good quality cattle at the end of the day. Uh, but, you know, the, often what we find is a problem is that people go in at the start of the year and there's too much ask for some of the early maturing breeds. The farmer walks away, he buys them elsewhere or he buys Frisians or buys something cheaper and then suddenly the, the dairy farmer is left with these calves that are only making 30 and 40 euros in the market and struggling to get a buyer when a, a flood of them comes in March, you know. So it's about building a relationship and just... You know, don't uh, the, the calf sales aren't aren't the biggest proportion of your income as a dairy farmer. It's a small proportion of it. You know, so you know, putting people off by expecting too much day one is is not a good idea. I'd say you know, temper your expectations. Set a nice mid range price for calves. Nothing too dear. No, they don't ex- beef farmers. I said don't expect it on the floor either. They do expect to give you something from. But um, you know, if you can do that, you'll build a relationship, and it should make things very smooth for years ahead in terms of selling calves. If if ever if trouble ever comes in terms of exports. Yeah, so I suppose Alan, the other thing that's um, interesting is probably that you mentioned earlier about the, it's the same. And there's effectively very little of a difference in price, and and more and more you're probably going to see that you won't get the option of a bad, of bad genetics through AI anyway. Um, but you said that there is that difference in terms of maybe. The better bull versus the poorer bull is probably going to be more expensive. The, is the dairy farmer, um, how do you word this now to, to word it correctly? The, the intention of the dairy farmer should be to sell the calves for a reasonable price rather than getting top dollar for every calf because he's put the effort into that DBI piece that you mentioned there, which feeds into the CBV piece. Because that purchase price is critically important to the success of your uh, guys in their business, isn't it? It is, yeah. And I mean, if you take it right, the, the, the top, the better producers that we deal with that would be some of the monitor farms would, would have a, um, you know, a stocking rate. I think they run through about 2.3 calves through to finish on every hectare. That's roughly what they run. Um, and if you take right that, you know, the difference, 100 euros a head in difference of a calf price, but, you know, if you take that the the early calf is costing maybe 200 or 250 versus the Mid average price is probably about one twenty to one fifty. You know, it's around, talk, call it a hundred euros in the difference between the buying price of the calf. That could that could increase or decrease net profit by, you know, two hundred to two fifty per hectare. You know, and, it, and we're not talking a massive margin game in this either. You know, it's it's we we the best the better guys are making around five hundred a hectare. This it's not it's not something you're going to, you know, um, make your fortune at really. Anyway, we know that that's there's not no secret in that, but. The buying price is essential that, you know, and, and it's about just having, a, I suppose, a relationship built up that you're not putting guys off by asking too much day one. And again, they're not going to be bold enough to come in and just tell you, you know, I'll give you nothing for your cars or I'll give you 20 euros or whatever. You know, everyone a medium price is all anyone expects. And if we can set it at that, everyone should be fairly happy. And most guys we talk to are happy with that, that they're happy to give a medium price, even if it's over what's available in the mark trade on the base that they know where the cars are coming from. And they know the calves are healthy and the genetics are reasonable. Yeah, I suppose it's an, an important. I think it's a very important point that you made there that the genet, the good genetics, will not cost people anything more than bad genetics, and effectively they can deliver a high quality animal to that customer that they have, uh, that gives them good potential to make a uh, return from the the system that they're running, and uh, like that they shouldn't 
necessarily expect to get paid more as such for using a better bull necessarily. It's it's the, to be fair to everyone, good genetics are required. Dairy farmers should make the sure that that happens, and then the beef farmer has to take it on from there and make sure that that calf is well reared in order to generate the the income for them. And it's important from that circular economy that they talk about, particularly in the the energy terms. But it's the same in in dairy beef. Like there's a huge proportion of beef coming from the dairy herd now at this stage, and uh, dairy farmers are very reliant on the beef sector to take the, the calves from the dairy farms because. Uh, probably somewhere, maybe you might have better figures than I have on that island, but there's probably at least 50% of dairy farmers are moving the calves away completely. Uh, there's probably still a good proportion of calves kept on on some dairy farmers, uh, on, the, on some dairy farms, and they will acknowledge the important, the change in quality of stock in the last couple of years. So just on that point then, the, the CBV, relatively new, Obviously, very much been driven by the National Genotyping Program coming to the fore this year. So maybe a lot of your bo- the a lot of the guys on the um, program with G this year won't have maybe huge experience of it. But what's been your experience of CBV thus far, and what way do you see it going into the future? And we'll wrap it up with that then. Yeah, I suppose okay. CBV is you know feeding back obviously into the genetics, the type of bull you use, as you said already. You know. There's, there's virtually no difference in cost between a, a, a good straw and a bad straw in terms of the carcass merit of a, of a bull. There's no difference in terms of calving difficulty in most of them or gestation length. So again, that's not that's not a cost to the dairy farmer of any description. In terms of CBV, it's a slow burner. Okay, um, it's something that's going to gather traction with time as awareness is created. Um, now that look CBV, the, you always would like to get the best CBV calves and say you have the best CBV calves, okay, etc. But it doesn't mean that you can't make money off a low CBV calf. That's an important point too. I mean, CBV is basically going to set a pricing structure in time, and you'll have high CBV calves that'll be worth X, let's say two hundred euros, and you have low CBV calves that'll be worth forty euros or whatever. And the the beef farmer is going to use that tool to price the calves to kind of gauge, okay, this calf I can. If I buy him for X, I can make that. This calf, okay, he's going to deliver a bit more. I can pay X for him. And that's what it's going to be for. Um, and it's not to say that some calves won't be saleable. They will be um, at a price, and whatever that price may be, but at a lower price or a higher price, depending on where CBV is. But it's going to, I'd say, look, with the genotyping, that's going to guarantee the, the verify the sire. We're going to have the, it's going to be up on the mark boards once you have a genotype on the calf. Um Every dairy farmer can print off his CBV of his calves, but you must register a sire. And that's the number one thing. There's a lot of them beef calves have no sire registered on them, especially ones by stock bulls. Um, and that's created a bit of a problem in terms of trying to generate some genetic merit information on the on the actual calves on the ground. So you must register a sire for your calf. If you're using the genotyping program, it's very easy to sort that anyway. That'll do it for you. Um, but... Look, it's it's something I think that's going to be the it's going to be the way we're going to sell calves in the future. CBV, we're going to be pricing calves based on the CBV of where they are, and it's what basically the first thing you're probably going to be asked in years down the line uh, when you're when you're purchasing calves. Okay, very good. So, uh, Alan, you've a uh, large open day on in Grange. Um, if there's dairy farmers that are maybe keeping stock themselves. Our dairy farmers that are looking for somewhere to go for a break after a, a long uh, season that's thus far, what's on show for people to see next week in relation to the dairy beef piece? Yeah, we, we have a full dairy beef village, so there'll be quite an interesting section there for anyone uh, that that uh, any dairy farmers that are either either selling calves or are keeping calves or whatever the case may be, and we'll be focusing on all the things such as you know early calf management, um, calf housing, the health of calves. We've got some of the results from Grange in terms of showing where these high genetic merit uh, bulls used on dairy cows, what they have delivered in terms of performance and profitability. Um, we have a forum there at half 12, actually, with some farmers that are actually buying dairy beef calves, um, showing their experience and what they're doing in their systems. Um, and we'll have some you know, live demos on, on um, smoke tests and ventilation and showing how to set up your sheds for calves, etc. So there's plenty there uh, for dairy farmers within that village. If anyone wants to pop by, um, and if anyone's ask any questions or anything look be sure and walk up to us and give us a, have a chat with us okay Adam that's a very good piece there um, thanks for your time today and uh, hopefully people will get benefits from that from the last, for the last couple of weeks of their breeding season thank you thanks that's all for this week's episode of the Dairy Age podcast and my thanks to Alan Dillon for joining me on this week's show 
Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Stuart Childs and join us next time for your Dairy Edge.